Everybody? It's a privilege, privilege to be here. Uh, so my name is Rob Schultz. I'm the Senior Director of IT at Interfor. Um, we are a sawmill company. We make lumber like crazy. And uh, uh, I look after, I'm responsible for 81 IT staff across North America. And, uh, and I was uh, originally in a role to deploy EAM to uh, 14 of our sawmills at the time. And uh, that's how I got introduced to Interfor. And I've been uh, implementing systems for a very long time in my career. So. Um, everything from finance to lumber and log and all kinds of things and maintenance and management. But maintenance and purchasing systems are my, are my, uh, are my joy and passion. So it's good to be here. So a little bit on Interfor. Um, our, I never, never waste an opportunity to do some recruiting for the company. That's what this slide's all about. <laughs> so anyway, our vision to be the most profitable and very well-respected forest products company in the world. Um, in North America, I think, as far as lumber production goes right now, we're sitting at number three uh, behind our friends in Canfor as well as uh, West Fraser. And, uh, and our mission is to build value in everything we do uh, every day. So, and this is a view of our Swainsboro, uh, Georgia facility here. So. so who am I? So I've been in it for almost five years, two and a half years as the director of IT. As I said before, I started in the project management function to roll out EAM. Uh, I've been working over 30 years in the, in the forest industry. I started in woodlands in GIS as a map maker. That's kind of where my uh, career began and uh, sort of fell into technologies and then project management and applications and, and that kind of thing. So for the last 20 years, I've been uh, working in, a, in mostly in IT. So I was, uh, we began our EAM deployment um, at Interfor in 2019, at least from my standpoint. We already had EAM in a couple of our mills, and I'll go into a little more of that. Uh, as part of the history of EAM and the company in a minute. And, um, and my very first CMS deployment was, was way back in 2000 at uh, Canforce 3 Pulp Mills in Prince George. So we implemented a system called Synergen where we retired uh, a custom system and an older version of, of Synergen for the new one. So that was uh, my first foray into this area of industry and it's, and it's been fascinating ever since. Um, so as far as my role as EM systems administrator, I still do a lot of that function. I am trying to uh, train other people to, to do more administration in EAM um, just because of my role in IT. And um, I manage a monthly maintenance and peer, uh, maintenance purchasing peer group forum internally within our company. So basically it's a, a one hour teams call once a month where we go through all the latest changes that have happened in EAM every month because we continue to revise reports and screens and things like that as we go and an opportunity for all of our users to ask questions. So, and I'm an avid fly fisherman. So that's, uh, that's what I love to travel when I work. So bring my fly rod along and see if I can get some fly fishing in. So who is Interfor? So we have 32 sawmills in North America right now. Um, We've been, over 50 years, we've been in, as, a, as a company, and uh, we're based in our head offices in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, we produce about 5 billion board feet of lumber for year, per year, so we're probably one of the top, we're in the top five, I think number three right now, as far as lumber producers in North America. So 5 billion board feet is about 300,000 homes a year. So that's about, you could build, I think, the town of Greenville 10 times, if I did some Google searching, <laughs> right? We could, re, we could rebuild all the homes in Greenville 10 times each year. So anyway, uh, we're about 5,200 employees. Um, we're about 2,000 of those are staff, well, 3,200 are hourly. And uh, we've grown quite a bit as a company in the last um, couple of decades, but most of that was in the last few years where we acquired 11 sawmills last year. Uh, if you recall, it's when we were basically wallpapering our offices with money because lumber prices were so high as a result of the COVID pandemic. So we had to, as a public company, if you have that much cash, you gotta turn it into something else, otherwise you'll get bought for your cash and uh, so we acquired a bunch of sawmills and uh, we acquired uh, nine of them in Ontario and Quebec and uh, two in New Brunswick last year. And uh, so we're moving, uh, moving them onto EAM uh, as quickly as we can. And we're still planning to grow more. We've got another, uh, we've publicly stated we want to be uh, 7 billion board feet by 2027. So we've got some growing left to do and trying to find wherever that's going to come from. So, but that's not my responsibility. I'm just, a, I'm just an IT guy. <laughs> so. Um, where, we, where are we based in, as far as our operations? So, so we are spread out in the, sort of the four corners of, the, of North America, if you will. Uh, we started in British Columbia is where we uh, first uh, had our first mills. Um, we actually, Interfor first was just simply a woodlands operation. We simply uh, harvested uh, trees and sold logs. Then we acquired some three mills in British Columbia. We expanded in the Pacific Northwest. And then we came into the south around 2013, 2014 with some mills in Georgia. Uh, we recently acquired four mills from Georgia Pacific. That was uh, in 2021. 
Um, we have two mills in South Carolina here at some, uh, Somerville and Georgetown. And then just last year, we um, acquired Eastern Canada, Ontario, and Quebec. And then just in December, um, our two mills in New Brunswick. So, so we continue to grow. Um, we produce, uh, again, primarily dimension lumber. We do have some specialty cedar products in, uh, in, uh, at Cedar Prime in Washington State. And we have an eye joist facility at Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario. And we do have bed frames, of all things, uh, in a very small plant in, uh, in Quebec. So, so we're, we're all over the place. Southern yellow pine is our primary species here uh, in the south, of course. And uh, there's some wonderful, uh, interesting operating constraints that we have there around how it's processed versus our, our mills in the more northern climates. So fascinating company to work for. I, and as you, as you may gather from my enthusiasm, I love this industry. I love this business. I've been in it for so long. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. OK, so our typical sawmills, um, 125 to 150 employees in each one. Um, typically, they run two shifts, six to you know, two eight-hour shifts. Um, that varies depending on, on time of year, to the kind of products they're running, and things of that nature. Um, we talk drying kilns run 24-7. So in a, in a, to, to change a log into a piece of lumber, um, it goes through the sawmill to get it cut into rough dimensions. Then it has to be dried through a kiln, about 24 hours in a, in a kiln. So they heat it up and dry it like an oven. And then they process it uh, fine uh, into its final product through a planer. Right? So the, the constraint point in our sawmill production is always the drying kilns. And that's why they run 24-7. So if you're, running, if you're ever driving by a sawmill and you see big clouds of steam, that's the kilns that are running, drying that lumber. So you'll see that all the time. And as far as our maintenance windows go, of course, then we have to fit our maintenance um, into in between those shifts, so between 2 and 3 p.m. or between in the, usually a night shift during the week. And then Saturday, Sunday, we don't run our sawmills unless they're behind on production, which is another story. And then uh, we do maintenance during the, the day shift on Saturday and Sunday. So, so what is our maintenance pressures, right? In other words, um, I think George talked about this quite a bit the last couple of days. You know, what, you know, nobody cares about maintenance, the last thing people talk about. Well, in sawmilling, it's true as well. So it's a commodity product, the more we make, the less it costs per board to make, and therefore, the higher the profit. So it's production, 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 production. You have to meet those targets, right? And then sometimes, in, in not sometimes, we do have a policy unofficially that we run some equipment to failure, right? We don't, make, you know, we choose not to maintain it because it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it will cost us more to maintain it than it would be simply to replace it, even though it may incur some downtime. It's kind of a strange thing, but this is the reality of, 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 our, of our business. Um, and we want to keep cost of maintenance as low as possible. And so this is, this is the, 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 the no-win situation that maintenance is in in many of our, in our facilities. So. Um, our EAM history, uh, entered for. Um, so the first two mills, was, and the, reason, the only reason I know this is because we have data in EAM that goes back to 2003. Um, it's not a lot. We just had two mills at the, t at the time. They weren't actually part of Interfor. They were uh, part of the Tolleson group, I believe. Uh, down in Georgia, and uh, we purchased those mills in 2013, and then we bought two more, and two more, two more mills in the south, put them on EAM in 2014. Um, in British Columbia, we had um, uh, another system that we were putting in uh, before I started with the company, and started in 2017, and it failed miserably, um, spent way too much money, was too grandiose a project, it just, the adoption was poor, the product was poor, all kinds of things. Um, and the reason I was hired in 2018 was to assess that project, and we ended up canceling it uh, shortly after I started. Um, and those were not EAM mills prior to that. They were running a, a custom system. So we had, to down, we had to survive a downturn of the economy in 2018 as far as lumber prices were concerned. So we couldn't start any new deployments until 2019. Uh, and then we started our EAM deployment um, at that point, when, and uh, we worked our way through until we have now up to 23 mills uh, that are using EAM. So, and we continued through the pandemic as well, through the deployment. So that was uh, presented some interesting challenges, but thankfully, uh, because EAM is easy to use and easy to adopt, um, we were able to, uh, to continue through that, even though we did a lot of those deployments completely remotely. So right now we're just under 700 users in EAM. And uh, just last week we deployed our first two mills in Quebec uh, with a French language interface. And uh, I thought that was a grand achievement until I talked to Cal Tire in our user group back west, and they, are, they have four languages or something silly on their EAM. So <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's quite interesting. So that's kind of our, our history. Uh, we've got uh, the mills in Ontario and Quebec. Well, they're running SAP and another system called Interall, and we'll be moving them over onto EAM continually now throughout the spring 
uh, until the end of June. And then we should have a 30, all 32 mills on, on EAM. So pretty exciting. All right, what's our footprint? So our footprint in EAM is uh, we have about 20 to 40 users per mill, depending on the size of the mill, depending on the level of maintenance maturity and how many people are engaged in using EAM. We use work orders, PM schedules, and we have parts and inventory on the maintenance side. And on the uh, procurement, we have two or three users per mill, depending on uh, where, as you notice, we were based all over North America and through our acquisitions, uh, we have slightly different organizational structures around procurement. Some, some mills we have a purchaser at every mill, and in other mills a purchaser will cover two or three mills. And then we have uh, uh, stores people in uh, running the storeroom in virtually all the locations. And uh, our AP is centralized, so we enter all of our uh, invoices into EAM. And uh, the three-way match occurs there as far as the POO amount, the receiving, and the invoice amount. And then once that's approved uh, and matched, it, uh, it goes to our Oracle financials. Uh, we do use requisitions, stock reorders as well, purchase orders, um, and then the, yeah, then this integration to Oracle is through Ion, and uh, we use Informatica as our integration platform for all of our uh, systems in the company. So. so, what was our methodology for deploying EAM? Um, I'm not saying this is a, a great methodology to follow. There are certainly some things I would change if I could, um, but we had a number of constraints that we had to work with. So. First constraint was from our Vice President of Operations, minimize the distraction to our mills. No kickoff meetings. <laughs> like, that's literally what had happened. Like, that's what, that's, that's what we did. So we did communications, we made sure everybody was aware of what was going on, but there was none of this big grandiose, hey, hey we're putting EAM, all this kind of stuff. So it, uh, um, anyway, it was, a different, it was a different kind of deployment, that's for darn sure. Um, EAM champion, of course, was myself in the company. Um, to drive this thing forward, and then we needed to identify champions within our uh, or key users in each of our mills that give us that central point of contact so that if they have issues or there's, if we want to follow up on, on different processes and stuff, we have an individual that we can contact at each mill. And that's, that's pretty important for us to, uh, to understand how our effectiveness of EAM. Um, and we start with our minimum requirements. So this is from a change management standpoint and trying not to scare people into a whole brand new system, all these new processes. This, this is, these are my famous quotes that I use at every mill. I said, if you create a PO in, in EAM, you have to receive it, right? So, and if you create a work order, and if you create a work order, because not every mill was creating work orders when we implemented EAM, it must be closed, right? And so if they can adopt those two rules to start with, that's a, that's a good beginning. And then from there on, we just we slowly build on top of that in terms of other, other functions and whatnot as part of maintenance and purchasing. So uh, we also enforce our standards. Uh, we have one work order document that's used in all of our mills. We do have a, uh, a bilingual version now, of course, that we have to. Um, we have only eight user groups. Um, that's including our admins, uh, uh, user groups as well. And uh, we have one purchase order document in English of the bilingual version. And we use the same PO and work order statuses at all of our mills. And I talk about um, the ease of use of EAM because it's really just a game of status changes. And we, we talk with our different user groups and say, your responsibility is to, is to change a work order status from work request to open approved, then the planner takes it off the scheduling, and then the tradespeople take a work order that's been scheduled, they get assigned, and their job is to make the status ready for closing, and then that goes back to the planner or the supervisor who then completes it and closes it off. So it's all about making things easy to understand by, by just focusing on the status change. Right? Mill managers, your job, PO waiting of vision approval, approved. That's your job. That's what, that's, the, that's what they do in EAM. They have one job. Even that's hard sometimes, but they get to it. <laughs> so, but uh, this is kind of our deployment methodology. There's some things I would obviously ch change if I could, if I had more time and money to play with. Uh, you know, I would, I would make it I would, do, I would spend more time on change management. I would, you know, as far as communications, I would have a kickoff meeting and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's just the nature of, of uh, the approach that they wanted uh, for us to, to carry out with EAM. And uh, it, it's worked, you know, so far, so, so good. Um, the deployment team itself is made up of uh, maintenance representatives from the mills, right? So we don't have an IT team that goes out and implements EAM. We have a business analyst and a technical person that helps, and we use Tony's group, of course, for other work where we have to data, do data loads and things like that. Um, but uh, primarily the, the, the education on EAM is being carried out by purchasers and planners who we solicit from our mills that already use EAM. 
uh, to go into our new mills and spend a week there and, and do their training. So um, it really helps with adoption because um, they live and breathe this system every day um, to help train our users. So. All right, so our deployment challenges that we have and every project that, uh, that, you've, that everybody's been on before has constraints and challenges that we have to work through. Um, so our target was to do two mills every three months. Um, and the basic approach there was to, uh, the first month was basically data gathering. So you're pulling data out of their legacy system, whether it's our internal system or MP2 in some of those cases, assets, parts information, take it, uh, PM schedules if we had the opportunity. Um, so the first month is just data preparation. Second month is where we start doing our orientation sessions, showing people it, with their data in EAM um, how work orders work, how the status has changed, all those kinds of things. We do one or two like sort of hour-long sessions uh, a couple of times a week for like two or three weeks before the end of the month. Um, and then we set a, a cutover date, which is uh, triggered by month end um, so that we stop receiving in one system and we start receiving in EAM. So that's our official cutover date. And so we were doing about two, two mills every three months that way. Uh, and that worked pretty well. Um, then the pandemic hit. We we're on mill number three. That was the Baxley facility in Georgia. And uh, so we had to deploy that mill without going anybody on site at all. So lots of teams meetings. So you're doing lots more training because there's nothing beats in-person training, especially when you're setting up data spies with the users and all that kind of stuff. It just makes it so much more difficult when you're doing it on teams. Uh, but we got it to work. So we did a couple of mills completely remotely. and. Uh, other challenges we had, of course, was our acquisitions. Like I said, Interfor is a, a growing company. And uh, so we acquired four mills from Georgia Pacific and our two mills in New Brunswick. Um, and the challenge we have with that is that we're not told about those acquisitions until 60 days before a cutover. So when you're told, and sometimes you only get even less than that, but typically you get 60 days to say, okay, we're buying these four mills. And in GP's case, those were uh, what were called asset purchases. So in other words, we acquired the mills, but none of the systems and none of the data that they used. We didn't have any access to any of it. So we had to beg and plead uh, for the GP guys to give us extracts of data as much as they were willing to so that we could uh, try and assemble something that was gonna be operational. Uh, because on cutover weekend, um, the Air Inter Force staff to send on there into their mills, we replace all the servers, networks, switches, uh, so Monday morning, um, the, the new Interfor employees come into their workstations and they got Interfor computers with Interfor systems and then they get trained that first week. So it's pretty hectic. And, uh, but it's just, it's just the way things, we do crazy stuff at Interfor <laughs> sometimes. It's not my design, it's something that I inherited. But uh, anyway, so, it's, uh, it's, so then, then we spend our first week training and support and that's where we bring in our you know, planner from another mill and a purchaser from another mill and they help the people get going uh, and those kinds of things. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite a, uh, it's quite a interesting challenge when it comes to deploying EAM. Um, others, my other, my other famous quotes I have when I try and, you know, uh, uh, appease people's fears about EAM. So we minimize our training time and we maximize our adoption. So we, we don't spend a lot of time, hours and hours in training. Um, we, our training classes are typically 30 minutes to do navigation, to do navigation, work order creation, that's like typically 30 minutes and you spend another 30 minutes practicing and then you come back two days later and it's a workshop and people just come in and do their stuff. So you spend a lot, a lot more hands on, which makes it very difficult when you're trying to do it remotely. Um, but if you're on site, it works very well. And I tell people that it, it, you need eight hours of using AM to get comfortable, right? So it's not two hours. You're not gonna be completely comfortable in two hours using AM, but it's not two weeks either, right? So that helps people gauge, you know, whenever you can give somebody an indication of how bad this change is gonna be, it really helps with the adoption, right? So this is, and to eight hours of using M is, is typical, right? So uh, our typical maintenance folks are, 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 and our purchasers are fairly comfortable after eight hours. So, and we have online, we have, all of our training materials are available inside EAM. We use a, an application called AppLearn, and uh, although I like Eric's method the other day, he was talking about a custom menu, that's free, we're paying for this one. Anyhow, so it, it makes all our training materials, we have videos, and our videos aren't super complex, they're basically my, they're, rec they're Teams recordings of myself doing training, that's our training videos. And uh, so we have those available, plus all the written documentation for all of our Interfor procedures uh, available right within EAM as well, so that's been a real lifesaver for us as far as support goes. Um, some of our keys to success, uh, having that EAM champion, uh, very important, just somebody who believes that this is the right system to be deployed. 
um, and having your super users on site in procurement and maintenance. We don't always have that luxury, um, but it's certainly something that we, that we try and pick out when we do initial deployments, find out who the keeners are, um, and make sure we spend extra time with them to make sure they're uh, going to be helping out their mill staff. Uh, well communicated plan, right? Change is hard. It is. It's, uh, uh, and if you've experienced it, especially if you've been acquired, never been, been through an acquisition and then being acquired by another company, it's, uh, it's quite uh, upsetting, to be honest with you. And uh, so we, we're very sensitive as much as we can to, to those people that are going through their whole job is changing, their company name is changing. Uh, so, you know, for many of them, um, uh, they've been employees of a company for 20 or 30 years, and we come in and you know, big bad interforce come in to buy them out. So we try and do our very best to, uh, to make sure the change is as smooth as possible. Our biggest challenge for myself um, was not, no, we were going so fast, it was not knowing how well the adoption was really sticking at a mill. Because we, we had to deploy so quickly, and then we had these acquisitions thrown in the middle of our deployment schedule. Right? So we were, we were heads down implementing and not knowing whether how much it was really sticking. Right? And fortunately, uh, it's very easy to monitor. You can, because it, it, we have one instance of EAM that covers the entire company, so we can we can monitor how many work orders are being created, are there are there PMs being created, are they being completed at a uh, you know in a reasonable amount of time? We have in our start center we have KPIs um, set up for every every mill, which is an organization in EAM, so we can monitor the use of the system. But that was my biggest challenge was just not knowing how well it was going to stick. So, all right, no problem. Um, the other thing we, we talk about here is there, don't do everything on the wish list prior to cutover. Right? So oftentimes, um, mills, and, and, and rightfully so, will use the opportunity of, hey, there's a new system coming in, let's do this with PMs, let's do checklists, let's do this, let's do this. And if they aren't doing it today, we really encourage them, let's not focus on that for cutover. Let's make it as much as we can what we call uh, a like-for-like -like deployment of EAM. In other words, if you don't have a, a full-blown PM program, we're not going to do it as part of implementation. We're going to simply get you in on work orders, and then we'll work with you to help build your PMs there. Because the, the more people are comfortable with a system, it's easier for them to then slowly ratchet up and take on different functionality. So this was, this was probably one of our biggest, key, biggest keys of success was like for like, right? Minimizing the impact of the business as much as it pained us, right? <laughs> in some cases, because it was, some of those implementations were very simple as a result. But you know, the, each of the mills is coming along and, uh, and, and increasing their use of EAM for sure. Valuing your people, of course, right? Those are, are your most uh, valuable assets when it comes to deploying. Um, and then supporting well post go live, right? So we foster our community of learners. We have our monthly you know, our meetings where we get together. Um, you know, and it's, it's amazing the questions that come out uh, because we've got such a diverse user group from all over North America. And uh, it's, it's neat to hear suggestions and being able to deploy suggestions. That's the wonderful thing I love about EAM. It's so easy to deploy changes, improvements, configuration changes to make things easier for people. And the nice thing about it is it improves everybody's lives all at once. That's the greatest thing. So. All right. So what are we doing in the future? Well, we have a parts catalog problem. <laughs> when you're going really fast, you don't have time to clean up parts. So you have to load them in just as they are because people have, if, like all of our Georgia Pacific mills, they, all of their parts storerooms were labeled beautifully. They had the best parts data catalog I have ever seen as far as consistent labeling and numbering and everything else like that. And uh, so we, we, you know, again, you don't have time to do a lot of cleanup. You just bring it in, you check for duplicates, and you do your best. You label all their storerooms with, you know, our Interfor part numbers. We just don't have that kind of time. So we have to go back and do it. And, of course, now we've done it like 11 new mills, we've got a big job on our hands in the last, you know, to make sure that we do all this cleanup afterwards and standardization because it, it, helps, our, it helps in procurement, right? And uh, the company's finally gotten big enough that we now actually have a corporate purchasing department. It's one guy. But at least he has an objective now to streamline some of our purchasing, reducing the number of suppliers that we work with, getting better pricing, all that kind of stuff. So, but he's got himself a catalog that's, a, that's in a bit of a mess. So other things we're looking at, root cause analysis. Uh, on the maintenance side of things, so being able to use EAM out of the box for just some basic root cause analysis, again, is, is one of those things that are being done on spreadsheets today, um, if at all. Um, but it allows, you know, champions within, the, within our organization on, from the maintenance side, start something new in EAM, test it out, see how it works, come with a procedure that makes sense, and then we'll be able to train it to uh, the other mills who are, who, who are interested in, in adopting it, um, and then it works out pretty well that way. 
Um, continuing to improve our PM programs, making better use, consistent use of task lists and checklists and those kinds of things. Um, and then integrating equipment condition monitoring. So we do monitor uh, some equipment in our mills. It's kind of spotty um, as far as uh, temperature, vibration, frequencies and that kind of thing. Um, but being able to integrate the, those uh, systems into EAM to generate work orders is something we want to do for sure. Um, similarly on the procurement side, supplier cleanup. <laughs> yeah, we've got a, we got a lot of, we got, you got the problem with 17, 20 years of data in there now. Um, you've got suppliers that are just, you know, we've got to clean that up and we changed our finance system last year too, which created all kinds of havoc. So uh, we've got all kinds of work to do there as far as cleaning up our supplier data. Um, we want to bring in AP automation uh, to basically take an invoice record instead of somebody keying an invoice into EAM. We want to be able to scan that and bring that record into EAM and process that through. So that's something that's on our, on our roadmap. And, uh, and then we're also looking at supplier pricing uploads as well. So again, as part of our corporate purchasing mandate to have pricing contracts with some of our bigger suppliers and be able to quickly and easily upload that pricing in DAM. And then on the, the fun side, this, this is like in our IT group, these are, the, these are the cool kids. They get to do all the analytics work. Um, so we're, we've started taking data out of EAM through the data lake into our data warehouse. Um, and so when you use tab, we use Tableau, not Power BI, but it's the same, same functionality uh, to do some, start getting into uh, purchasing and analytics as well as some work order stuff as well. But that's a little bit uh, future down the road. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what it's like to be in a EAM and a growing company, at least from Interforce perspective. So, cool. <laughs>